It is uh, great to be here. It's just church as I always remembered it. <laughs> you know, boring, a lot of ritual, people aren't alive, afraid to express themselves. But other than that, it's been a good time so far. No, I wish my wife was here. And, you know, I could start with lots of, uh, I've done a lot of research about the challenges in marriage. And I'll tell you a story to get us started. And there's notes that you need to pull out because I'll really use them. But I want to show just some pictures. I'm not going to say a word, but I want to give you the history of about the last 50 or 60 years of family and marriage. And, and for some of you that are married just a little under 67 years, um, well, here's what I want you to get. It is really, really hard to have a great marriage. It's a super challenge. The other thing I want you to get is, from God's perspective and your perspective, there are few things in the world that are more important to you or to his kingdom. And then what I want you to sense is that the ground underneath you, while you're trying to do what you need the most, what pleases God, and what may be the greatest testimony of anything other than the resurrection, is two people deeply loving one another and giving them their lives for each other. As you watch this, think of how the values have changed and why it's so difficult. And then we're going to talk about, rather than all the problems, how do you make it work? I mean, how do you have a marriage that isn't like, okay, or we're surviving, or we stay together? I mean, it works. It really works. So watch these pictures. Leave it to Beaver, yes. That was a great one. Twin beds, remember that? The blended family. First time. Three's company. He was pretending to be someone so he could live there. I don't need a man. They're losers. This is a whole new family. Nobody works, but we drink a lot of coffee. And then this is every father is a doofus. And then, you know what? Let's just completely redefine it, right? Um, there is a couple things that I would share just by way of sobriety because I really want you to be motivated. 25% um, of all the families in America, um, only 20, one out of four have a mom and a dad whose children are theirs that are used to be what we call the nuclear family. Um, one third of all the people that get divorced will live below the poverty level. It's not just devastating emotionally and spiritually, but financially. 40% uh, of people in America do not believe in marriage. 80% of people in Europe do not believe in marriage. It's passe. Uh, the, the new MO, 65% of uh, people today live together prior to being married. Longitudinal studies are telling us now, after 10 years, even if they marry later, after 10 years, those who live together prior to marriage, only one out of 10 will still be together a decade later. What, what I'm just describing is what doesn't work. What's easy, what's popular, what's on TV, what's on Netflix. 94% of all sexual interaction of a couple in primetime TV is with someone other than their marriage partner. And so what I just want you to get is you are being bombarded, your kids are being bombarded with messages that tear people apart and cause marriages not to work. And just so you don't think, because we've had so much fun, um, well, you know, I bet he's been, he's the pastor, and I bet his dad was a pastor, and his grandfather was a pastor, and he and his wife probably have had this wonderful life. They've been married 40 years, and you should clap on that. It's, it's, a, it's a bigger miracle than you think. I have four grown children. I have 12 grandchildren. And um, before you, you know, and I've got a picture of our family that's great. My wife has amazing genes. Everybody has blonde hair but me. And, um, but I met my wife after she came out of a very abusive home. And so what abusive girls do is find someone that will love them. So she married very young went to college and put him through college. Then he started selling drugs, and she wasn't completely into that world at all. And then she gets pregnant, and he finds out she's pregnant, and he had already had another woman on the side for a year. 
and he leaves. And she has two little babies, no money, no hope, and a great boss who told her every day, Jesus loves you. Jesus loves you. He has a plan for your life. About a year later, she came to know Christ as her Savior. I met her about two and a half years after when she'd become a woman that really loved God and God had really changed. And so if you want to make a marriage hard, what you do is you get two dysfunctional families. So I grew up, my dad was World War II vet in Guam, Iwo Jima, Purple Heart. The only reason he made it out was he was bleeding. And one of his buddies rubbed his back and showed him, he said, Reb, you've been hit, you got to get out of here. And so he lived with the guilt of almost everyone who went there died, and all of his team died but him. And so he became an alcoholic, barely functioning, a good school teacher, but all the things that happen in alcoholic families. So these two people both come to Christ. We get married, and I'm thinking, this is going to be great. We're going to do this God's way. We love each other. She's an amazing woman. You know, maybe someday I can even adopt these little boys. They were four and a half when we got married. And this is going to be great. Six months later, I, by the way, we put everything. I'd been a, a basketball coach and a school teacher, and I'd played basketball around South America and joined an Australian team and played throughout the Orient. And then out of that, God moved me to in, into ministry, and we put everything we owned in a rider truck, we pulled our car behind us, and we went to seminary. <laughs> and six months into seminary, if I could get a divorce, I would have. We couldn't communicate. We couldn't resolve conflict. We didn't have baggage. We just had truckloads of stuff. I loved her with all my heart. She loved me with all her heart. She was the most committed Christian I had never known. I was sold out as I could be. I went to seminary, and we just couldn't make it work. Thankfully, I had a professor named Paul Meyer who started the Meyer Mid Earth Clinics, and he was giving a lecture, and he was describing my marriage. And I went down afterwards and said, have you, I mean, did someone tell you about me? He said, no, why? I said, well, you just described our family background, our marriage, our problems. He goes, oh, that's very typical from a home like this, a home like this, and I said, well, mine's not working at all. I said, why don't you come see me? And that began um, 12 sessions of marriage counseling at the low, low student price way back then of $85 or $90. And I was making uh, 1000 a month, working full time and going to school. Uh, the book that you'll receive and the message I have is about the supernatural God taking us through very, very hard, deep times and I will tell you, uh, just went through cancer about nine years ago. And I thought we had a great marriage at about 31 years. And I will tell you, if you can learn to do, if you can hang in there, if you can say, God, no matter what, he can give you what you would never, ever, ever, ever dream. I remember coming through cancer and thought I had a four-speed car. And we went to, after the surgery, we went to Stanford, we went to all the you know, procedures and radiation. And I remember we'd always stop at a little coffee shop and we'd split a, a little cookie and, and she would be really weak. And I didn't know if I was going to get another month or another year, another five. And all I could do is look at her and think, I didn't know I could feel such love or be so loved by anyone in the world. And I thought of all that we went through and Christ was at the center. And what I want you to know is he can fix any marriage. He can make good marriages is great. But I will tell you, it will require some things. I'm going to tell you what they are. You got your notes? Ready to go? In marriages that work, we're going to get really positive. Marriages that work have five things in common. I developed these in the book. They're super, super practical. I mean, I get so specific, some of you men will hate me. By the way, memo, guys, if you want to make great, great progress... Grab the book first and read it very, very quickly. Otherwise, this is what you're going to get because 80% of the women will grab this way before you. Honey, have you started the book yet? Uh, yeah, I'm, 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 look, I got a lot of work on right now. We're doing a lot of stuff. Well, you know, this, this chapter on, is there a man in the house? I know I'm supposed to only read my part right now. <laughs> Buddy, you better get there before she does. <laughs> I got a buddy who... Uh, uh, 
Quick story, since we're having so much fun. I got a buddy who played quarterback at Boise during their big heyday, and we play golf together and do a lot of fun stuff. And as we got to know each other, we were driving in the car, and I turned to him and I said, well, how long have you been married? And it was really quiet. I mean, I've, I knew him for quite a while. I'd been going to church, sat on this row. We had a lot of fun together. And he kind of sheepishly said, well, I, 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 I'm not married. I said, you and I named his wife. I said, what? And that started a journey. He had two failed marriages, came to Christ afterwards, and was scared to death. And uh, interestingly, uh, I got to marry them after about a year and a half journey we had together. And so exciting. So his wife got this book. I said, bud, you, you, better, you better jump in ahead of her or you're going to have a lot because the bar is going to go up. Marriages that work have... Uh, Five things in common. The first one is couples view marriage as a holy covenant before God and not a social contract between people, okay? When it really works, there's a glue. There's something that's so permanent. They view it as a holy covenant and not a social contract. That's why God said in Genesis, a man will leave his father and the mother, and the two will become flesh. It's why Jesus will quote that same passage out of Genesis 2. It's why the apostle Paul will say, this is what marriage was designed to be. It's why God says in Malachi 2, God hates divorce. Now, before you get too uncomfortable, I married someone who's divorced. There's certainly biblical grounds. But I will tell you, a lot of our unpackage of our baggage is when we don't follow God's ideal design. I praise God for redemption. I praise God I got to adopt those boys. I'm, I'm, I'm utterly amazed at what God has done in our family. If you look on the back, I, I put a little picture for you because what I know is when we use words like a covenant, you have really good teaching here, but a lot of people wouldn't really know what a covenant is. And, and as I walk through this on the back page, flip it over, I want to just explain what a covenant is because I want you to get like never before this sense of, whoa. I mean, I know I said I do, and I know I said before God and these witnesses, but I want you to get the sobriety, the seriousness. A covenant is a solemn and sacred agreement and a guarantee one person makes with another. It, literally, the Hebrew word is to cut. It's the idea of your blood and her blood. Your blood and his blood coming together. In other words, this is a life or death proposition, and the only thing that would ever break a covenant is if one of you dies. That's the idea. God made a number of covenants with Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus. And at each time, there was a, there's characteristics. Number one, it's initiated with a vow. God said to Noah. God said to Abraham. God said to Moses, this is what I'm going to do. The conditions are then outlined. Sometimes it's unconditional. God says, this is what I'm going to do no matter what. Or sometimes like Mount Sinai, this is the covenant. I'm going to do this, and if you want my blessing, you need to do this. The third characteristic, it's ratified by blood. Noah, there's a sacrifice. Abraham, there's a sacrifice. Moses, sacrifice. Jesus. The ultimate sacrifice, the new covenant, is ratified by blood. And then it's sealed with a sign. We all, or most of us, wear a sign on our finger that says, uh, I'm out of circulation. I've made a covenant before God and with this woman, and nothing and no one's going to come between it. For Noah, it was a rainbow. For Abraham, it was circumcision. For Moses, it was the Sabbath, this miracle that you could work six days instead of seven, and we're going to trust this all-powerful God even during the harvest. And for Jesus, it was the Holy Spirit. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. He would actually take up residence. A marriage, then, is a holy covenant initiated by a vow, ratified by blood, and it's an irrevocable commitment of unconditional love toward an imperfect person. An un irrevocable commitment. I have one friend who uh, I worked with for a while, and 
came from a, a little bit different family background. And, you know, when you have divorce in your past, and like it is in our family, and, uh, you know, when you have friends and parents, there's almost a culture that, you know, and he literally, early on in his marriage, he got out a dictionary, and by the time his kids were coming up, and they looked up the word divorce, and he took one of those little razor edge things, and he actually cut it out of his dictionary. He said, it's not in the dictionary, and that word will never come out of my mouth. It'll never come out of your mom's mouth. That's not an option for us. See, intimacy requires safety. And the reason that it doesn't work for people to live together is because what both people know is, I can walk out. I'm kind of committed. We're sort of playing marriage, and it, you know, and we're going to test it out. Testing cars out before you buy them, great idea. Testing a person out before you marry them, bad idea. Because what happens is, I would have, I would have quit. My wife would have quit. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When someone makes you nuts, I mean, when you can't resolve a conflict, when they say things that are so hurtful and you just want to scream or, or I would just walk out and, or she wouldn't talk for like two days and I would walk around the bed. I'm in seminary quoting verses. Honey, we're supposed to talk. Can't let the sun go down on our anger. Right now, we got to talk about this. And she put the pillow over her head. You know how many nights? I mean, it affects every area too. Like, you know, I'm just like, honey, it's been a long day. You look so beautiful. And I wounded her, and I didn't know how, and I didn't build relationships. And so she, she turns this way, and I would turn this way, right? The old back-to-back, -back, right? You had any of those lately? And then I had a, I had a way that was going to solve it. So I would go, huh. That meant I'm still awake, and you have time to apologize. <laughs> and to my dismay, what I would hear in about three or four minutes waiting was, oh. But here, here's what I would tell you. If you can understand that you have made a vow before God and divorce, don't let it enter your mind. The moment it enters your mind, an old high school person on Facebook looks a lot better. The moment it enters your mind, you think there's an escape hatch. You have to come up with a word picture that says there's no way out. Do I understand there's some biblical issues that where a divorce can happen, where someone can break the covenant? Of course. But this is not now. Uh, if you would walk right out of, uh, she lived in the rural, rural part of Appalachia, and you would walk out of her house and take two steps, and there's literally a mountain. It, it's, all, it's all rock. And then the rock comes down, and there was a little spring, and so they built a house around it, so it's all rock. There's a spring, and they put all their food in it. And the man who had the biggest impact was a, a bricklayer who discipled me. And I had a lot of long walks with God. I... Okay, I made a commitment. I'm going to keep it. But this is terrible. I hate this right now. And the word picture that, that God gave me is, Chip, I want you to think of you walk inside of that little spring house. Teresa does. There's water. There's all the food you need. You can even get an exercise bike in there if you want. And as you two are sitting in here, your buddy the bricklayer is taking Haydite block, and he sealed you in. So, you know, you don't have to talk to each other. You can be mean to each other, but there's nowhere to go. And when you get there's nowhere to go, you know what you do? You do whatever it takes to solve the problem. Lesson number one, you can't change him. Lesson number two, you, he can't change you, her. You know what I mean. <laughs> and what, it, what I mean is when I came to, she's making me nuts, but the only person that I can change is me, Okay, God, this is a prayer. You pray it, it's the beginning of a great marriage and a tough journey. Whatever you want to change in me, you, you write it down, I'll run it down. Whatever you want to change in me, because I can't change here, but here's what I do know. I majored in psychology, undergraduate and graduate work before seminary. There is a family and there's a relational kind of like dominoes. When you change one part of a relationship, it's like a chain reaction. You can have huge impact even if your mate isn't cooperative. The second characteristic of marriages that work are couples understand God's counterintuitive design to meet their deepest needs. 
The, the intuitive design is, this, this is what I wanted. Teresa, love me. I want to be a great wife, be affectionate um, because of my background. Could you cook great meals? Could you take care of everything? A little unrealistic expectations. And, and I'm really happy when you meet all my needs. And when it wasn't going well, there was only one problem. It was her. She didn't do everything I wanted, and she didn't do in the way I wanted, and not when I wanted. And she had this ridiculous idea that the problem was me. And so what we tend to do is like, I want my way. No, I want my... Now, we did it in a sophisticated... I mean, we're Christians. I'm in seminary. We weren't yellers or screamers or... But, you know, if your basic concept is... Our marriage is really going to get better when she dot, 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 or when he dot, dot, dot changes. You are deluded. And that's not God's plan. Marriage is fundamentally one of the most important things he puts you in to make you more like his son. And part of that is iron sharpening iron. Flip over again. Let me show you God's counterintuitive design. First of all, you'll notice it's a triangle with God at the top, man on one side, woman on the other side. This is God's ordained design. Two, notice at the very bottom, it says Genesis 2.21, write the word oneness underneath there. If you want to use popular terms, write the word intimacy. That's what oneness is. That, that's, that's the goal. You leave, you cleave, you become one flesh. So this is God's design. So he's at the top because he designed it. Then notice this intimacy or this oneness has three levels. So where it says spirit, I want you to put a little arrow in your notes. Someone needs a pen. Guys, do not sit there and watch your wife take notes. This is, I'm trying to help you guys. Hey, more fights happen after marriage talks than any place in the world, right? This is, I'm trying to help you guys. Hey, by the way, here's my pen. Jason, I want that back. I want to see your notes afterwards. I, I will check on it, all right? So next to where it says spiritual, write soulmates. God wants you to be one spiritually. And, and you kind of know what that is, but I didn't know about you. I didn't know how to do that. We tried reading the Bible together. That didn't work. She was so spiritual. I was a pastor, and I was intimidated to pray with her. We just had to start and take baby steps, and we've learned to become spiritually one before God. Second, it's not just soulmates as brothers and sisters, but, but it's your mind, your will, and emotions. Put an arrow next to that one and write best friends. The friendship can't stop. Think, think about first you were attracted and then you hung out together and you talked and you took walks. And remember when you got a call or a text for no reason and he, gosh, he brought flowers or he wondered how you were doing and you were interested in one another. Life was not, well, who's going to take the kids and whose game is on Saturday and I'll go with the girls, you go with the boys. Well, we need to be at church by six. Well, we got to do this. We're going to do that. You know what? If you're not careful... You can love God, come to church, and spend your life in an SUV or some car, catering your kids all over the place, living hurried lives, and missing the greatest gift in the world, and it's the person you climb in bed with. And I will tell you, if that doesn't become the number one priority after your own time with God, your marriage, your life, your future, and your kids will never be what they could be. I got news for you. I love Georgia too, but... I'm just going to go on record, and there's probably one exception in a room this size. Your kid's not playing at Georgia. <laughs> okay? And, and if you're now into lacrosse, they give scholarships, 1000 a year. It'll, you'll spend 15000 driving them around and getting all that equipment. We've got to stop listening to our children and thinking that being there all the time and having them involved in everything makes a great family. Look at the stats. A great family is kids that grow up in a secure environment. My dad serves my mom. My, my mom's head over the heels over my dad. They, they're on the same page when they discipline us. They, they say no about these things. And yes, we can do this, but, you know, it's one sport this season, and this is what we're going to do. And we don't enable them. And, and they put their tablets and their phones, you know, at the, at the sacred place because we actually, are you ready for this? 
This is, this is Bible, but this is the research. Eat as a family. Oh, my. There's a website now that just talks about the power. I mean, you don't even talk about God. Families that eat together, it's amazing. SAT scores, emotional health, all kind of things. Believe me, this was God's idea. And the final thing is so your, your soulmate's best friends, and under where it says body, write passionate lovers. Sex was never intended to be, oh my gosh, it's 10 o'clock. I can't believe this guy. How come I always have a headache and he has all kind of energy? You, you know why the top? Now, if you, if you talk with most men, if we're hanging out together in a locker room or playing golf or this or that, and you get really close and you get really vulnerable, and we do talk about these things, but you, I, I would just tell you this. I, if I could get with a group of men tonight and I could say, when's the last time you had sex? Four days, three days, two months. Your husband keeps track. <laughs> just trying to help you ladies out. Here's what you need to understand. He's not over, he's, he's living in a world where he's been bombarded. But there is, there's something that happens in your husband's brain. Oxytoxin, when he makes love with you. Few things make him feel more like a man. It wants him to open up and he feels a closeness. And it's way beyond just the, the early days of marriage of, you know, the lust and the, oh, oh no. <laughs> I will tell you what, as you mature, one of the things God wants, here's his picture, here's his picture. There's a picture of two people that pray together and love one another and share hurts and are vulnerable and are safe and know that no matter, no matter what I do, no matter how badly I mess up, this person just refuses to give up on me. Do you know what that does for the another person? You know that every human being is longing to look into someone's eyes Someone who knows the good and the bad and the ugly and there's no pretending and they, and you, not just their words, but their life. I love you. That's the closest you ever get to experiencing God's love. And when that, when there's that kind of spiritual connection, by the way, the research is amazing connection between spirituality and sexuality. When this isn't here, hey guys, you know how your wife feels when you want to get together, but there's not tenderness you haven't prayed together, she feels used. And you know what? The excitement is when there's a spiritual foundation and you're best friends and you're connected from the heart, and then this becomes an expression of your oneness, your oneness before God. And of course, you know, there is certainly great physical pleasures that God designed, but I heard some people being married 30, 40, 50, 60 years. I will tell you that the physical aspects of sexuality are probably most exciting in your early years, and the reward and the depth of sexuality is far better in your later years. And what you can, that's why pornography is such a blight on our soul, because it pictures people who don't exist having relationships that don't exist with air blowing into people's hair, <laughs> with bodies that are made up, with bodies that are touched up, that create the same kind of connection and dopamine and serotonin in a brain that crack cocaine does. And what you do is you, you begin to mortgage the very thing that God wanted to give you for something that doesn't even exist. It's pseudo-intimacy. And so it's not just I feel guilty and shame and I want to stop. It's about, it's about love. Uh, we've started multiple ministries of helping women now cope with what do I do because I couldn't understand why he doesn't want me. How could he, how could he, and there's a journey and this triangle, this counterintuitive, it's at the heart now, here's what I finally had to learn. It's biblical. It was really hard. So I came to, and I'm going to ask you to come to, and I don't care if your marriage is in trouble. I don't care if, like, you know, we're doing okay. Yeah, we're doing okay. We don't have any big problems. By the way, when that's what you think, don't assume that your partner thinks the same thing. 
I've been, man, I've been doing this pastor thing for 36 years. Sit down. Well, how are things going? Well, yeah, pretty good. You know, not, not bad. And how about you? <laughs> I don't want to have it. I don't love him anymore. I can't believe it. He did it. I never. Um, might want to have that talk. But what I came to was, here's the counterintuitive part. And, and we talk about the roles and the power in just a second. God, that woman isn't just someone I want to love me. That woman is your daughter. And I'm, I'm now, by your power, I'm going to treat her like a sister in Christ. I want to see her develop her gifts. I want her to experience Jesus through me. And the way Jesus has been caring for me is when I'm responsive, he loves me. When I'm not responsive, he loves me. And that's by your grace is who's going to show up. And then I, you know, Lord, you know I'd like to have a lot more sex than we're having right now with these struggles. But I'm going to be your best friend. And I'm going to learn how to listen. There's a little, you know what, the one thing I don't like about this book, I paid $90 a session for 12 of them. And then about seven or eight years later, we went back for a little, you know, touch up. And there's a, there's a little tool in there about how to communicate that's priceless. And you get it for free thanks to your church. But what I can tell you this is that when, when you say that's the goal, what makes her feel cherished? What makes him feel like a man? What makes him feel like you can do it and I'm for you? Instead of, well, I'll tell you what. I'll be a lot more affectionate when he steps us as a man. And you know what? Yeah, I can't even get him to get the garbage out. You know, and I got, I got this. I'm doing the checkbook. I'm doing with the kids. And, and you know, and when this, when this happens, in fact, today I talked with a young lady where I was working out. You know what? My, my, uh, my husband's now texting with an ex that he used to sleep with. So you know what I did? I said, no. I, I texted an ex that, that I used to sleep with. And then I said to her, I said, well, how's that working for you? She said, you know what, it's terrible. I said, could I share with you God's plan? And what I want you to know is that if you would sign up for this counterintuitive, and, and let me say this as clearly as I can, your behavior, your time, and your energy needs to declare that apart from God, my wife or my husband is more important than our children. It's more important than our work. It's more important than our ministry. It's more important than our money. It's more important than if we can remodel the house or not. It's more important than our career path because you can get all of that stuff and find yourself alone and broken. And, and here's, here's the deal. I know a lot of you. How many have kids? Quick. What, what, what do you want for your kids? I mean, what do you really want from them and for them? Can I tell you what, what produces kids with great self-worth, a faith that's real, great decisions, and not doing things that ruin their life is having parents that love each other and are completely sold out to Christ. And you can do that. But you'll make a lot of hard decisions, and you'll disappoint people, and you'll disappoint your kids because you got to talk deeply every week. You got to have a date on a regular basis. You got to have some tools. I, you know what? Can I tell you? I bet I've been through, it's been 40 years, so don't exaggerate, Chip. I've probably been through 30 books with my wife. And sometimes it's just real slow. And, and don't get like, you know, we're this goody two shoes. It's just like, hey, why don't, you, why don't we both read this and let's. On our, we had a date every week, and it was a prolonged sort of leisurely breakfast because, like your pastors, my weekends were pretty full. And so what are you learning? And, and you know, we, we would go to a conference, or we came to a night like this. And, and it goes really good, and you plateau, and then God messes with you, and you have some things, and then you have a dip, and you have to focus, then you go to another one. And it just takes such it takes the kind of intentionality, it takes the kind of intentionality that would allow someone with amazing gift to end up at Georgia and be a star quarterback. That kind of discipline. 
that kind of regiment, that kind of, we've got to do this. The question comes up then, well, okay. I mean, this is, uh, this is George. All right. I'm... All right. You know, he said, you know, I'm, I'm going to step up. Well, just before you do that, Bubba, um, <laughs> let me tell you, if you try this one in your strength, you're going to fail. The third is couples that view themselves as, write this word, powerless to fulfill their roles apart from Christ's supernatural enabling. You know, I, our marriage didn't change until it was like, I'm desperate. I can't love her. I mean, I choose to love her, but she makes me nuts. And apparently, I make her nuts. Notice the big marriage passage from Ephesians 5. Notice the context. Chapter 5, verse 1, be imitators of God, therefore, as dearly loved. In other words, the key is you're already loved by God and live out of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Then verse 15, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but wise, making the most of the opportunity because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the will of the Lord. Do not get drunk on wine, which is dispensation, dispensation, debauchery. I'm making up words now. Instead, be filled, this is a command, be filled with the Holy Spirit. And if you want to know if you're filled with the Holy Spirit, here's the characteristics. Speaking to one another in songs and hymns, making melody in your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks for all things to God the Father, and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. It, when you tell God, I can't do this, but I believe that you designed it and you gave me a manual, and I'm powerless, I need your spirit's power. And by the way, he's not going to call on the phone. God brings, how, how do you get the spirit's power? First and foremost, you ask for it. Second, you have to be surrendered. If you're still playing the game, Lord, I really want to obey you so I can have a great marriage or so my kids turn out right or so this or so that, you know what? You, you've missed the point. Lord, I want you to know that you, you have a kingdom and it's coming. And you want to use me and my wife and you want children to grow up in such a way that they don't know that we go to church. What they wonder is, how do you love each other the way you do? Why do your kids respect you in that way? You know, how did you handle it when your mom died suddenly? I work with you, and this is a personal story of a friend in one of the super high-tech companies who just got the biggest raw deal ever, and people are coming to him day after day after day. And, and instead of bad-mouthing people, they're saying, what's with you? How do you respond to this culture and your boss? I mean, you're one of the highest up, highest ups. And he said, I've had more chances in the last six weeks to share Christ. See, that's the agenda. Um, I think your pastor and I would both agree that the, quote, sort of American gospel that has become love Jesus, come to church regularly, Tide, that's important. Go on a missions trip and be really nice. And God magically promises you'll have a great marriage. Your kids turn out right. You'll be upwardly mobile. They'll be the best in sports. And everything's going to go great. And then 20 years from now, you're going to sit around the table Thanksgiving and sing Kumbaya. I got news. There's cancer. There's drunk drivers. You will make bad decisions. Your kids will make bad decisions. And what will really happen is if you think there's a quid pro quo with God, that if we do these things over here, then we're going to get these things over here, your Christian life is not about God. It's about you. And if it's about you, it doesn't work. Because Jesus was emphatic. Anyone who seeks to save his life, that's what he's talking about. If you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. If you put in the time to have the kind of marriage that God wants you to have, and it'll be the greatest thing ever, but it's like planting seeds. You know, you don't plant a seed and go, oh, wow, okay, three days, three months. You know what? It's layer upon layer. You put some structure into family time, date time, time in God's Word. You get filled with the Spirit when you're willing, you're surrendered, and then you're taking in God's Word. You're talking really honestly, and are you ready? You can't do it alone. 
It's the community of God's people. Man, I don't know how many times I've had coffee with a brother, and, and you know, you're, I'm the pastor, and I'm just telling him, right? One of my sons going through a big time years ago. Something happens over here. I get a raw deal over here. You know what? When I get that way, I want Teresa to start to, you know, love me more, and I start putting pressure on her instead of, you need brothers and sisters that no one's pretending to have it all together. And you share life at a raw level, and you come before God, and you pray. And you know what? God shows up. And here's what's going to happen. After tonight, you start reading this one, and it's a little bit. Then you'll miss for a couple weeks, and then you keep reading. And, and then, you know, you just decide privately. Like one of the exercises in the book is you, it doesn't take a genius, but you ask your mate, what are the top three ways that you feel deeply loved? I could tell you what most people say, but I'm, you write this down. Well, and let me ask you, what's the top three ways that you really feel loved? Okay. And you know what you do? For the next 14 days, you do one of those every day. I don't feel like it. Who said love's about feeling? You've been watching too much Netflix and Hallmark. <laughs> love is giving another person what they need the most when they deserve it the least at great personal cost. Never forget that. Love isn't an emotion. I fall out of love. Jesus, are you ready? If, if he was going on emotion, he would have not gone to the cross. Did he feel like it in the garden? He agonized. Love is choosing. I can't do this, but I refuse not to do it. It's choosing to give another person what they need the most. After what she said, after what she posted, after what he's done, after how he lied to me, giving another person what they need the most when they deserve it the least at great personal cost. Is that not a picture of what Jesus did? I mean, is that not? He gave you what you needed when you deserve it the least at great personal cost. See, really, marriage is about discipleship. You can't be a good husband. You can't be a good wife unless you embrace. Lord, I heard your voice. If anyone comes after you, I must deny myself. Take up my cross. Die to myself, my self-interest, my control, my expectations. It's got to be my way. And follow you. And when that Jesus starts showing up in you more and more, Katie, bar the door. God will do amazing things. Well, couples, number four, not only have committed to a covenant, they follow God's design, recognize they're powerless and get power from the, the Scriptures by view of the Holy Spirit and God's community, but couples embrace their uniquely defined roles in a spirit of mutual submission to God and one another. Did you notice that verse 21 is the arc over this? There's been so much discussion about submission, and like submission's a dirty word. Jesus submitted to the Father. Anybody have a boss anywhere, or have you ever had to submit in the military? Like, actually, it, it, it aligns things. Submission, this whole issue is not about who gets to say what. It's who's responsible. It's who has to, the ownership. And you have two impossible situations. I don't know about you ladies, but when Jesus tells me I'm to love my wife the way Christ loved the church, I'm thinking I'm completely incapable of that. And believe me, my wife, knowing me very well, says, Lord, you want me to respect and honor my husband all the time, even as wacky as he is? I can't do that without you. But if there, and so listen to the roles. We, we walk through them, and I actually take a chapter and say, what's a man to be, and then what's a man to do? What's a woman to be, and what's a woman to do? And then I walk through and say, so, and what would that look like spiritually? What would that look like emotionally? What would that look like in friendship? What would that look like with your money? What would it, what it look like with your kids? And just very practically, know your roles. Wives... Be subject to your husbands as to the Lord, for the husband's the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But if the church is subject to Christ, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. And to balance it out, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of the water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or such thing, that he should, that she should be holy and blameless. Guys, I'll, n- I'll never forget when I read this passage and I thought my job with my wife is Christ's job with the church. And I remember saying, honey, what do you think your spiritual gift is? She goes, I don't really know. I said, let's, let's go on a journey. Honey, what? When, you know, I'm, I'm the pastor and I'm busy in these things, but what, what, what's a dream that you have that, and, and my wife loves hurting people and marginalized people and, and people that have been through broken relationships. And, and, and I, I began to realize my wife was this hurting person with a shattered self-image that had been through such... And I just realized, you know, Chip, you know what your job is? Your job is to cultivate that flower so that she could become all God wants her to be. The church isn't just about you and what you do. And it's not just about my responsibility and her responsibility. When I begin to say, I want to help you become the most beautiful person inside and outside. And then one day I actually woke up and thought, our house is actually a big reflection. I mean, we had stuff broken, and she would ask me to fix it. And oh, yeah, yeah. Well, at first I can't. <laughs> but but I don't even I didn't even notice. And I mean, you know, I, I, it's like, are you ready for this? This is this is about 20 years ago. I finally, it was a few things started to dawn. My wife really loves me when I vacuum. You know, I don't have to be asked. Just, and this has been a journey. I just notice whenever the trash is getting full and I take it out. And, and when she doesn't have to ask, believe me, it's like 10 points. When she goes, oh, by the way, it's about 1.5. Uh, years ago, one of my oldest sons was being mentored by someone. And, um, you know, this idea of cherishing. He said, Dad, you know, Larry and I met. He's a psychologist. Do you know what he does every morning? I said, what? He makes coffee and brings it in bed to his wife. I mean, that didn't even compute to me. I didn't even know how to make coffee. Um, and then he said, you know what, Dad? You know, he's probably 20, I don't know, no, had to be in his early 30s. He said, you know, man, I've been doing that for Lynn, and man, it just, she feels deeply loved. So after Teresa got over the fact that I really couldn't make coffee about 20 years ago, I said, what I do every day. And the first few minutes of the day, it's not always real long, but... You know, make it at night, and our first moments are, you matter. You're the biggest blessing that I've ever had. Whatever, quote, success, whatever you ever accomplish. Dallas Willard is completely right in this great quote of his. The greatest gift that you will ever give the people you love and the greatest gift you will ever give the world is not what you do. It's who you become. It's who you become. And when we start developing a to-be list instead of so focused on the to-do list, boy, I want to be a godly man. I want to be a godly woman. I want to be a sensitive husband. I, I, I actually, Pastor, if I go over, just yank me out of here. I started writing down on cards who I really wanted to be, and I just read them over. Because what I learned from Romans 12, too, is that you don't change by trying hard. You change by renewing your mind. And I wrote, I want to love Teresa in a meaningful way each and every day that's sacrificial to me. I want to be the kind of dad that models the attributes of my heavenly father. I want to, and I just started, I I made some cards for her and cards for my kids, and and I just read them over. And what what I found was as I read those things over, instead of try, 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 my mind changed. My motivation changed. We talk about that in the book. Uh, there is a role for a man, a role for a woman, and um, when you really love one another, it's very rare. I can think of very few times, maybe three in our marriage, where we really disagreed. But at the end of the day, the buck has to, has to stop somewhere. I am morally responsible for a roof over the head of the Ingram family. I am moral 
Lee responsibility for the spiritual development of our home. I am morally responsible to make sure that we have enough money to pay the bills for us as a family. I am morally responsible to cultivate, I don't do it all, my wife's relationship with our family and our kids that we walk with God. And what I would say is what's happened in our day is a lot of women have about three jobs. They're a wife, they're a mom, and many of them work outside the home. And then, you know, I would just ask you, here's a few questions. Guys, I'm not throwing you under the bus, but this is some deep things to think about. And everything I'm talking about is what I didn't do. Ask yourself, who keeps the checkbook and pays the bills? One of the big things, we started doing it together. You know, I actually, you know, a lot of what we do online now, but just every two weeks so that, because she felt the weight of the world. When you're both together and one of your kids disobey, who gets up and disciplines them? When school time comes and you have to make a decision about, is it this school or that school? What about so-and-so needs clothes or shoes? Who's asking all the questions about what we ought to do? See, you know what leaders do? They initiate. You know what leaders do? They plan. You know what leaders do? And we, you're living in a world where all the media has told you, we just got a world where moms drive the car, moms take care of this, mom cook the food, mom works outside the home, then she comes home. And, and we think we, we come home and deserve that ESPN is the answer to life. And so she gets... She gets overwhelmed and doesn't feel loved and sensitive and watches a Hallmark movie or a romance novel hoping that some invisible person is going to love her like that. And guys, spend your time with work and sports. It's, it will take a dramatic shift, but I am telling you, man alive, does God have great plans. The fifth and final one, is, and this, is, this was a big one. Couples believe that conflict and challenges with finances, in-laws, sex, children, and communication are, write this word, normal and result in heart makers, not deal breakers. You know, you know I, gosh, we had, here's the deal. Some of you, you've been married, about three days or eight days. <laughs> We're so glad you're here. They're looking at each other like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> are, you, are you ready for this? I'm just going to, you know, I've been married 40 years, and I've been counseling people. You are going to have problems with your in-laws. You're going to have problems in your sex life. You're going to have problems with communication. You're going you're to have problems with money. You're going to have problems with relocating. You're going to have problems with personality. And guess what? It's normal. You, here's what's happening. God is here, he's shaping you, and you're becoming one. And as you're becoming one, this, this happens. You start bumping into each other in your will and her will. And my family did it that way, and I want to do it that way. And then if, if you're like us, how many of us married like the opposite? Oh, my gosh. I'm an extrovert. She's an introvert. She processes quietly. I process out loud. I mean, every, we only have to take one of those, like, personality tests. If I'm north, she's south. If I'm east, she's west. It makes for a great team once you stop doing this. But when you can realize, oh, there's so many. There's a young guy, he was in the arena league for a while, goes to our church and is in the financial world now. And up and down and all kind of marriage problems and struggle, 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 struggle. And I look at him, he's like, okay, you're super successful. You have this beautiful wife, beautiful kids, great job. And, I mean, he's just miserable and his wife is miserable. And we were, um, we were walking one day. And finally he said, you know what? I mean, we work on this, and then we worked on that. We worked on this. You know what? It just shouldn't be this hard. This is, this is ridiculous. I mean, I get up every day, and I mean, you know, I didn't do the dishes, or there's this. It just shouldn't be this hard. And I think I had one of those Holy Spirit moments. <laughs> I said, uh, I won't use his name in case he hears this someday. Uh, I said, now, you... You, you, like, were sort of the last cut in the NFL, right? Yeah. Played in the arena league and were a star, right? Yeah. So, so that means you played in college? Oh, yeah. So did you play in high school? Yeah. Um, help me with this. So 
you, have you lifted weights at all during that time? Did you ever have two a days? Oh, he goes, man, are you kidding me? I, I said, was it hard? You ever do wind sprints? You ever get chewed out? I mean, I, I said, now, you're playing at this elite level. Could we go back? I, and, and the lights came on. He said, man, it's the hardest thing I did. I paid a huge price. I said, you're telling me that you being a football player, you were willing to work and suffer and hard for that goal, and you won't do the same thing for the most important relationship, and God gave you that woman? Dude, are you nuts? I said, a little bit like that. <laughs> and you know what he said? I never thought about it that way. See, here's... When your expectations are warped, she ought, we ought, they should. It ought to be easy. Anybody start a company? Was it easy? Anybody play an instrument and you're great? Was it easy? Any, anyone who's an artist? Any of your kids? Any, anybody raise kids and go through the ups and downs and you have to discipline, love them, affirm them, discipline, love them, affirm them, and then apologize for where you messed up? Was it easy? See, I mean, this was enlightening for me. This is great. Well, right now we're going to work on um, our finances. And by the way, none of these are problems. Finances mean we have different values. In-laws mean that we don't really understand the, the leaving and cleaving because we're trying to please mom and dad, and we're not making us the number one, and we've got to be on the same page. Sex basically is problem is communication. And, you know, tell you what, when you're not communicating, you don't feel loved, you're not connecting, you don't want to have sex. Children are a lot about values and expectations. We live in a world where you so want your kids to be happy, you give them what they want instead of what they need. And usually one parent is the merciful, lets them break the rules, and the other is a little too hard. They need the balance of both of you. At the very bottom, you'll notice this. Marriage that works are couples that build the foundation that creates families that thrive and nations that endure. Um, I, wanna, I just want to close with a quote uh, written by a Harvard sociologist. His name's Carl Zimmerman. He studied the rise and fall of every empire in the world history. More specifically, he wanted to discover and trace uh, what happened in families in the empire. He concluded that families go through three phases that last, but just before the empire falls, in his book, Family and Civilization, he listed these characteristics when Rome, when Greece, when the Persians fell. Marriage lost its sacredness and alternative forms of marriage were advocated, is number one. Number two, feminist movements flourished. This, this isn't like equal rights, this is radical feminism. Three, parenting became more difficult. Four, adultery was celebrated, not punished. And sexual alternatives and perversion abounded, including bestiality, but especially incest and homosexuality became common in the day. No commentary on loving people that have any sexual dysphoria or struggles. It's just look at our culture. The greatest thing that could ever happen is a generation of Christian families and marriages that work. Lord, I want to pray for my friends. It's, a little, it's unfair to not have 40 years to show them all my failures, all of our struggles, all the anger, all the problems. Lord, how many times I had to apologize to my wife and her to me. Lord, we were two broken people from very dysfunctional families but I stand here tonight that your word is true. God, you, you want to help every person in this room and every person joining online. You want them to know that the only thing that breaks apart a marriage is what Jesus said. It's just a hard heart. If our hearts get soft and we're willing to forgive and receive help and work by your power, you not only heal, you want to make the kind of marriages that the world is asking would you please tell me how you love one another? Because what you have is what I want. In Jesus' name, amen.